Setbacks can become setups. And I encourage you, if you've got a pen or something to write with, I'm going to give you just some, some principles that I want to share with you from this text that will guarantee to encourage you if you're going through a setback. Can anybody identify me? Are you going through a setback in here? Say amen. amen. Okay, all right. So you've been there. You know what it feels like when everything's going good in your life and all of a sudden, dun 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 Dun, 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 dun. Jaws, you know, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you get tore up by this unexpected circumstance or event, just knocks you off your feet, and you're thinking, what's going on? Lord, I'm obeying you, and this bad stuff keeps happening to me. What do you want me to do, God? You been there? Well, that's what this passage is about. Paul wrote this letter to the church of Philippi when he was in prison, and he was going through setback after setback after setback, but here's the point of the text. Paul's saying, all the things that look like are, that are setbacks in my life are actually God setting things up because he wants to show up in a big way. You see, oftentimes we go through setbacks. The first thing we think of is, what are you doing, God? Where are you? What's going on here? Have you ever heard of this, this principle of the omnipresence of God? Anybody know what that word means? It means God is everywhere present. It's a cool term, all right? It means he's everywhere at the same time, at the same place. It's just amazing. God is big like that. Well, there's also this thing in Scripture where you see this manifest presence of God. You see, the cool thing about uh, Fellowship Baptist Church is every time you gather together, you have one passionate pursuit, and this is what makes this church so special. The number one goal of Fellowship Baptist Church is you want to experience the manifest presence of God every time you get together because you know when God shows up in church, people's lives are dramatically changed, marriages are restored, addictions are broken, and it's happening here. When God shows up, he manifests his presence and lives are changed. But what I want you to see in this passage is God wants to manifest his presence in your personal lives as well. And he uses the setbacks to do it. See, setbacks in our lives are really setups for God to show up in a big way. Are you ready for this? If you guys are ready to dig in the passage, say amen. Amen. All right, let's get into it. Philippians chapter 1. Here we go. I'll begin reading in verse number 12, so let's start there. Paul writes this from prison. He says, But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. In other words, the gospel is advancing because of all of the setback that I'm going through in my life. All right? Verse 13. So so that my bonds... In Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. That's the opposite of what you'd expect. Paul's in prison because of preaching. You would think everybody would squirrel away and hide because they're afraid. But it's the opposite because God's showing up here. Keep going. Verse 15. So indeed... So in some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of good will. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set here. I am set. God put me here for the defense of the gospel. What then? It doesn't matter. Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, I will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation or my deliverance through your prayers and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and hope, that's a good phrase, we'll talk about that in a minute, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness or courage, As always, so now also Christ shall be magnified, clearly seen in my body, whether in my life or by my death. All right. So with that said, I want to to share. There's there's three things that I want to point out to you from this text that Paul, um, that helped Paul usher in the manifest presence of God in his setbacks. So I want you to write this down. There's three things that, that will help us. If you're going through a setback right now, this will help you usher in. How many of y'all want to see God show up in your life? Say amen. I mean, you got people at work that are lost, that you work with on a regular basis, that just don't know anything about the power of God. And you want Jesus to show up at work. You want Jesus to show up in your home. And everything's crazy. I mean, it's just madness. 
Well, God will do it, and he'll show up in a great way. But here's three things that I noticed from this passage that Paul did, that if we're willing to do, we can expect the manifest presence unfolding in our life as well. So the first thing I noticed this is that he had clarity. Write that word down, clarity. What I mean by clarity is a focus. He had the ability to focus on his purpose. The ability to focus on his purpose. That's what clarity means. Uh, A good definition, if you look up Webster's definition of clarity, this is what you'll find. It means it's a quality of being easy to see or to hear something. Sharpness of image or sound. So Paul, as he's unpacking this whole thing, mind you, they didn't have Facebook back then, guys. They didn't have Instagram. They didn't know. They didn't have the newspaper. So they didn't understand what was going on in Paul's life at the time unless he told them. But notice in the passage, all he says in verse number 12, he says, but I would you that you should understand, brothers, this is, I want you to understand that the things that have happened to me have fallen out rather to advance, the, to further into the gospel. So all these things that have happened, but you're, it leaves you the question, <laughs> what happened? What happened to Paul? They don't know what happened to Paul. We know because we have the book of Acts. And by the way, I strongly encourage you to go back and read this in the book of Acts chapter 21 and 27 and 28. The Bible is very, very clear, all of the setbacks that Paul went through. But one of the things I just noticed here is that he had a fixation, a clear ability to focus on his purpose. I'm here because God is working and God's going to use me to advance the gospel in my setback. That's why I'm here. Now, I've learned a lot about clarity over the years, but I first learned the value of clarity when I was in college. Uh, It was was three years into my dating or courtship relationship with my wife, Um, and I was, you know, you know, guys, you know me. I'm trying to mack on my woman, you know. I'm going to, I'm going to, I was, I was, I didn't want her to just leave me, you know. I was just courting, you know. She could have just found another good looking guy, (laughs) not as good looking as me, you know. It's only a limited supply, you know. And so I was, I was there and I was, remember going to college and, and, and trying to, I was poor, all right, poor college kid, but I wanted to marry this girl, all right? I wanted to marry a northerner, you know? I'm from Florida and I, there's just something special about northerners, all right? So, brunettes, one brunette, one brunette, that brunette, all right? So, um, when we were there in college, I remember, so I went to the, um, the mall looking for a beautiful diamond ring, all right? So I went there. Now, they say on the commercials, every kiss begins with K. Every kiss begins with K, right? So I decided I'm going to get me a kiss, all right? Bump that. I'm going to get a couple kisses, all right? So I went to K's Jewelry looking for my kiss, and uh, I get there, and this, I'm introduced to this guy with this big curly mustache, and uh, he says, hey, come over here, kind of scary guy. And he says, hey, I want to I tell you about these diamonds. And he says, I'm like, yeah, teach me about diamonds. And the first thing I learned is that I, was, <laughs> I would never be able to afford being engaged. But, um, but the, the second thing I learned was the value of clarity. See, he began to explain to me about how diamonds, how, how, what makes them valuable are three things. The cut of the diamond, the color of the diamond, if it's bright and beautiful, and the clarity of the diamond. If you can see the diamond with clarity, what's going to happen is light's going to shine off of the diamond and it's going to radiate the entire place around. That's what you want. Light shines, bling! You know, that's what it's all about, the bling, all right? So I get there, and I'm like, yeah, I like clarity, but how much does clarity cost, you know? And so he starts telling me about the price tag, and I learned very quickly how valuable clarity was. But he, I remember his, every his salesman's got a pitch. His pitch was, yes, yes, but I know. Um, but if you have clarity, she will be very happy. I'm like, and I'll be very broke, you know? <laughs> so that's great. But how true that is. When you come to this passage, that's what Paul is telling us. When we have clarity, the ability to focus on our purpose, it will lead us to great joy in the midst of horrible setbacks. And I want, he's going to unpack that for us in just a second. But in order to have clarity, you and I both understand clarity only comes when we choose on purpose to not focus on other things. Not necessarily bad things, but we have to focus on one thing. And when we have clarity on the one thing that matters, which is our purpose... It will lead us to joy. So there's three things I want to show you. Right here, there's something I noticed that we tend to struggle with when we're going through setbacks that we tend to focus on. And when we focus on these three things, they always cloud our, our clarity. We'll never have clarity when we do this. First thing I want to show you is this. You don't find Paul struggling or focusing on his problem. He's not focusing on the problem that he went through. Remember, go back to verse 12. 
It says that these things which happened to me. And you're asking, what things happened to you, Paul? What was it that happened to you? Well, let me tell you what happened to Paul, just to bring you up to speed on everything that actually did happen to him. He was drug out of the town square and stoned to death. The Bible says he died in the town square with big stones chucking at his head. These aren't little pebbles. Big stones being thrown at Paul, and he's dead. The Bible says he was raised back to life supernaturally by God's power. That's another story, another sermon. And then after all that happens, he somehow comes back to life, wobbles off with probably broken bones and all the pain you can imagine there, and he goes, he goes somewhere to recover, only to be beaten up again, and then arrested. And then eventually, he had to call out and say he was a Roman citizen. So they shipped him to Rome. They put him in a boat. And the, 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 the captain was brainless, and he got on the boat, and he's like, we're going to go to Rome, even though there's bad weather here. And Paul's like, this is a bad idea. This is a bad idea. If you get in this boat right now, we're all going to die. And so he says, bad things are going to happen to us. And Paul, Paul went back, and he, the guy says, we're going to go anyway. So he gets in the boat, and the Lord kind of tells Paul, you're not going to die. It's going to be okay, but I, the ship is going to be destroyed, and you're going to end up on a desert island. That's exactly what happened. So he gets stoned to death, raised to life, then he's beaten up again, then he's arrested, then he's on a boat, and the boat gets destroyed, and here's Paul floating on a log, just trying to get back to the, to the, sea, the sea line, um, and he gets to the shore, and he gets off the boat, and he's freezing cold, as you can imagine. I mean, it's cold outside. He's, got, he's wet, soaked, he's soaking to the core, and he goes around grabbing some wood because he wants to get a fire going, and as he gets the fire going, out comes his snake and bites his hand. I mean, come on, God, are you serious? Um, snakes hanging from his hand, you know? Everyone's looking around, I'm like, what's going on? What what, this guy's bad, this is a bad guy. You know, everyone thinks, he's, uh, he's gonna die tomorrow because the snake bit him. And it's the whole thing. But if you look back at all of the ha- things that happened to him, God was setting him up. All of those things that happened to him, God was showing up in special ways all along the way. So what I noticed here is that now he's, we find Paul in prison and the Bible says that he was chained from his ankles to his wrists, all right? And he's chained 24-7 to a guard. But Paul doesn't mention one of those things to the Philippians. Not one. He doesn't spend any time talking about his problem. You know what? Let me ask you this. In your setback, are you spending too much time focusing on your problems? Or on the problem of the setback? You know how you can tell if you're focusing on the problem? Fear. Fear. If you're afraid right now, it's because you're focusing on the problem. You see, Paul, we don't see him doing that. All we see here is saying, you're not going to believe this. The gospel is advancing. It's spreading like crazy. People are talking about Jesus, and while I'm in prison, I mean, I'm chained to a prison guard 24-7. They have to have shifts, and every, every time they get to me, I'm not asking them, you know, am I going to die today? Is today I'm going to get my head cut off? No, no, no. He's saying, you got to know Jesus, man. Jesus has changed my life. I'm in here because of Jesus, man. See what happens? He's not afraid. Are you afraid? If you're afraid, it's because you're focusing on the problem. The second thing I noticed that he doesn't focus on is he's not focusing on the pain of his setback. Think about it. He's in prison, in chains. Unfortunately, I know all too well what it feels like to be in handcuffs and shoved in the back of a police car. And I know what it feels like to be in a jail cell all alone. That, I know what that feels like. And it's horrible. It's painful. There's a pain that you experience that just, you can't even articulate. It's just a horrible feeling. But not one time do we see Paul talking about the pain in this passage. He's not even thinking about it. He's not even focused on the pain. Do you know how you can tell if you're focused on your pain in the setback? It's because you're going to start doubting. You know you're focusing on pain when you start doubting, God, is this ever going to go away? Do you even care what's going on in my life right now? I mean, I have chosen, this is my life, this is a snapshot of my life. I have chosen to obey you, God, to go and do something that is ridiculous, to plant a church. And as I'm obeying, one thing after another, I keep getting doors slammed in my face, and I'm tired of it, God. Are you even doing anything right now? Those are real conversations that I had with God. I was doubting him in a big way. And I just, it was so hard. But you know, the reason why I was doubting him is because all I could see was my pain. All these other guys were just clarity. I mean, God, they knew exactly where they were going. Great things are happening. And all I could see was my having to go to my son that night and say, son, I still don't know where we're going. Are we going to have a home? I don't know. It's a hard conversation. So those are, those are the pain, but I was focusing on it. The third thing I noticed that he's not focusing on is not focusing on the people in his life. 
Drop down to verse number, uh, let's see, verse 15. Notice here he says, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife. So this tells us that Paul, while he was in prison, some people were trying to take advantage of that. These were jealous people in the ministry. You ever met people like that? You know, you're serving God, you're trying to obey the Lord, and all of a sudden somebody's got something stupid to say, something mean to say. Oh, Fellowship Baptist Church, yeah, they're the liberals, you know. They're the ones who just, you know, they don't, they don't have any, any, you know, true values. They don't know what it means to be, they're just, they got all sorts of weird stuff going on. People wearing white, I mean, just wearing white and singing weird songs and, you, ever, you know what I'm talking about? Jealousy, strife, in a personal way. You know, when people, how many of you guys have ever been so frustrated by people before? Amen? They're just like, people, it's like, are you even, you know, sometimes you just have to fast from Facebook because it's just awful. You get frustrated by it. But he's not focusing on these people. And they're, they're so silly. They're, they're, they're making, they're thinking that they're going to add affliction to Paul. But Paul's like, it doesn't even matter to me. Look, look at verse uh, number 17. He says, but the love of, uh, but, but, but the others of love, knowing that I am set here for the defense of, of the gospel. I, Paul says, I am so focused on the mission that God gave me. I know why I'm here. I'm here because of the defense of the gospel. The Lord put me in this prison cell. Ooh. Did you hear what I just said? The Lord put me in the setback. But that doesn't seem like God would do that. Why would God do that? Because God's got something he wants to do with you in the setback. That's that's a very powerful truth. Nothing happened by accident here. He says, I was put here for the defense of the gospel. And I love how he ends this. He says, in verse 18, what then, notwithstanding in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. It doesn't matter. All I can see is God's doing crazy things. He's showing up in amazing ways. So here's, I love how it ends, verse 18. He says, and therein I do rejoice, and yet I will rejoice. This is so powerful because when we have clarity that we are here for one purpose, God is allowing the setback in your life. Lean in right now. This is very important. God has allowed the setback in your life that you're going through right now. Because he wants to use it to set up an opportunity for him to show up in a way that only he can do. So that everybody around you will say, that was God. There's no way that anybody could explain that. That was all God. He manifested himself in an unbelievable way. That's what he's showing us in this passage. And you know what happens when you, when you get there? When that, when that reality sets in? Joy. Joy unspeakable. That's what Paul's saying. I rejoice. I rejoice. But you don't understand what I'm going through, Joe. I'm in so much pain. Stop focusing on the pain. You don't understand what I'm going through. It's too hard. Stop focusing on the problem. And stop focusing on the people that are being jealous over you. Don't do that. Focus on one thing, your purpose. God has you right where he wants you because he's going to do something special. That's powerful. So Paul had clarity. And that's one thing I wanted to show you that we need if we're going to usher in the manifest presence of God. The second thing I noticed is that Paul had confidence. He had confidence you know, that God was with him. Confidence that God was with him. In all of this, all right, let's, let me show you this, where I'm getting this from. Uh, drop down to verse number 18 again. We're going to read this one more time. In 18 it says, What then, notwithstanding in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and therein I do rejoice, yea, I will rejoice, for I know, listen to the confidence in this, for I know that this this shall turn to my salvation, or my deliverance from from jail, through your prayers, and the supply of the Spirit of of Jesus Christ. So he's very, and by the way, in the next three verses, he uses the phrase, I will and I know, five times he's emphasizing to us, he's got an incredible amount of confidence in the midst of his setback. But the question is, where is he getting the confidence from? What what makes him so confident that this is going to turn out okay? You ever been there? Like, how do you know that this is going to turn out? Joe, you just left and sold your home. Don't you think that that was a little dumb? Yeah, it was dumb. (laughs) It was dumb. But I'm confident that God was going to do something in this. He wouldn't have told us to do this if he wasn't going to provide for it. And so that's exactly what happened. And so he's confident. Let me show you where he got his confidence from. This is so cool. All right. In verse 19, he says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation, and here's how I know it. It's going to happen because it's coming through your prayers. That's the first thing I want to teach you to do. If you need confidence 
This, is so, this, is, will, this will build your confidence in your setback. You need to lean into the body of Christ. Lean into the body, the, the people of God. Let's be more specific. Lean into this people of God, all right? So I need, I need some help. Could my guys, could three of you guys come up here for a second? I don't care who three. You guys are studly. Come on up. Michael is coming up for an illustration. This is my first encounter with Michael, all right? This is a special moment for me. Um, Michael is doing a phenomenal job, I hear, uh, in the youth ministry. So, all right, we're going to be... We're going to be a, uh, we're going to represent the, the people of God, okay? So when I talk about leaning into the people of God, this is what I mean. Let's huddle up, arms on shoulders, all right? We're going to make a circle. All right, so this is an example of what I mean by leaning into the people of God, all right? So when I go through a setback, all right, something's going to happen, right? I'm going to become lame. I'm not going to be able to do certain things, right? Well, oh, oh, thank, that's special. Okay, all right. So, all right, all right. So what happens is, you know what, do you see what's happening? They're bearing me up, church. They're bearing me up because they're supporting me, and now I'm just, you know, that's it. So, thanks, guys. All right, so that's, that's what Paul, stay up here. Wait, I'm not done with you guys here. So that's what Paul, <laughs> so that's what Paul is teaching us in this passage. He says, when you learn to lean into the body or the people of Christ, it will build your confidence in a way that you can never expect to happen. And it happens through their prayers, so that's so good. But now let's say, let's make a straight line and hold each other's hands, but not in a weird way. Okay, all right. <laughs> All right, so, all right, uh, that's, that's another special moment. Okay, so, all right, so here's the thing. Now let's say, if, if we choose to just stay in a row, right, and we're not, we're going to try and lean into the body of Christ like this, it's going to be a lot harder for them to hold me up when I'm going through a setback, right? It's going to be a lot harder, but here's the thing, that is certainly a way to lean into the body, but it's a bad way. We need to lean into the church, into each other, like this. Holding in, because when I'm closer, what I'm saying is, the closer I get to these people, the easier life's going to be when setbacks come. Did you hear that? You will never, you you, you might be able to man through your setback like this, but it's certainly going to be a lot harder and a lot more miserable for you then you can do it like this. And that's what Paul's saying. Do you hear what he's saying? If you're not connected to a smaller group, life is cool like this in church. It's so cool to come to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night and live life like this and be a part, but it's so much better when you're living like, like this. All right, you guys have a seat. Thank you. I appreciate that. I like your boots too, man. They're really nice. Okay, all right. So, it makes sense, church? Say amen. All right, so that's what Paul is describing here for us, leaning in to the people of God. Paul is experiencing that in a very real way. He's getting letters from people saying, listen, we're praying for you, Paul. It's, it's gonna be, you know, we, we understand just a little bit of what you're going through. But they didn't have any details. They just were praying for him, sending him letters, sending him money to help him out. That was awesome for Paul, and he needed to hear that. Now, the second thing that built his confidence was this. It was the supply, or you should say this, he depended on the Holy Spirit of God. He learned to depend on the Holy Spirit of God. Go back to verse uh, 19. He says, for I know that this shall turn out to my salvation because your prayers, I'm leaning into the, the people of God. You're praying for me, and I love it because it's giving me confidence. But the second thing is the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That word supply is an unusual word because it only appears twice in all of the Bible. But it has this idea of the hand of God supernaturally coming down from heaven and putting his hand on your back when you need it the most. It's this extra, you like the phrase, the wind is at my back, you know, we talk about that. It means it's, you just have this unusual strength, this unusual ability to have tenacity through it all. It's the Holy Spirit of God giving you his hand to hold you up in your setback. That's what this word means. And I try to think of a way to illustrate that. And my son came to my mind. Right now, I'm trying to teach Landon how to ride a bicycle. And it's like a tricycle. Well, the other day, he, we had him on, a, on our driveway. And our driveway has a little bit of a slope. And he, he went down the driveway, and he fell off the bike. And it just, he, was, he was hurt, he scraped up his knee, he was crying. He was just petrified of getting back on that bike. He was afraid. All he could remember was the, the pain that he was experiencing when he was thinking about it. He remembered the problem, so he was afraid, and he was just, he just couldn't, he doubted that he was ever going to be able to ride this bike. You see the connection? He, all he was focusing on was the pain and the, and the problem, but then here's what I did. I said, hey, hey, listen, Landon, come here. Let's get back on the bike, and this time, I will hold you up. 
You will feel, Landon, my hand on your back, and that will be enough. You'll know that daddy's right beside you, and you'll feel my hand holding you up, and you'll be okay. He says, oh, okay, daddy, okay, daddy. He gets back on the bike, he starts pedaling, and he felt my hand. You know what happened to him? He had confidence. He kept pedaling and pedaling and pedaling, and all he could know was, my daddy was with me. My daddy gave me the support that I needed, and I was okay. That's exactly what Paul is describing here in this text. God, in the moment of your setback, when you just feel like it's going to be too hard, God will supply that need. He will come down, whether it's a financial need, unexplainable need of finances, he'll provide it. If it's something you need energy or, or, or just, you know, just some of the right words to be spoken to you, he'll get them to you. He will provide that for you. But he does it. Listen, he'll do it through the body that you're leaning into and the spirit of God that will hold you up. That will build confidence in your life in the midst of a setback. That's what Paul's describing for us here. And there's a third thing I want you to see in this is that um, he had courage. He had strong, strong courage. Um, Listen to this. Let's drop down uh, to verse 20. He uses this phrase. He says, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. Listen to the words. I mean, just like... Okay, so he goes from having clarity. He has this razor-sharp focus on his purpose. He knows why God has him in this setback. He understands that God's going to want to manifest his power and his presence here. And that brought about, and he understood the value of the confidence of leaning into the body of Christ. And then the, the support of the Holy Spirit brought confidence in him. So between the clarity and the confidence, it gave him this unbelievable courage like no matter what happens it's gonna be okay and guess what god's gonna show up and it's gonna be amazing get your popcorn out buddy because it's gonna be a show that's what he's saying here all right so he it's it's it, so go back to the 20 i love these words he uses, he uses three words let me have you circle them if you if you have a pen he says according to my earnest expectation and hope Three different words in the English Bible. But in the Greek that Paul wrote this letter to the Philippi, it's all actually one word. It's one word. And it's an unusual word because it's never spoken anywhere in literature. In other words, Paul made up a word here, guys. He was so excited. He had so much courage because he saw the clarity and he had the confidence. He just made up a word and just said, boom shakalaka, that's going to be the word here. It's going to be awesome. That's all I can say. He, he was just, you've been there where you've been so excited that you just, you just know, you just know this is something God's going to do. God's going to do something great. I just know it. It's confidence. It breeds his courage. And here's what the courage does. It gives you the ability to face forward towards your future. Face forward towards your future with expectancy. Like you just know it's going to happen. And God's going to do something great here. It's the only thing that can happen. All right, so he says earnest expectation and hope. I'm going to break this, this one word down to you. It's actually three separate words that Paul combines into one. It's the word apokaradokia, all right? It's one, one, he combined three words into one, but here's what the word actually means. It conveys this idea that I'm going to turn away from focusing and concentrating on all my problems, on all my pains, and all the stupid people in my life that are talking about me, And I'm going to bless the Lord. I'm going to stretch forward and wait for God to show up. That's what it means. I mean, he's someone. Someone's going to tell me after this sermon. I know it's going to happen. But Pastor Joe, listen. I've been experiencing this setback for a long time, and it's not going away. It's just not going away. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to believe the Lord. I'm trying to have the right patience and just trying to endure it. But it's not going away. Here's what you need. You need some apokaradokia in your life you need to start saying no i'm not going to listen to this i'm not going to look at this i'm going to lean forward that word dokia in the greek actually means to stretch your head forward in such a way where you're not even able to see in your peripheral vision the things that are over here okay that's what it means it's the idea of running a race and you some people go like this you know to stretch out what are they doing i am so focused on that red tape that i all i can think about is a red tape right now that's what paul's saying I am, it's like all of it together. I am determined. I have this willpower. I'm not going to stop believing God in this midst of this, of this chaos. And that's what happened. And you know, the crazy thing is, Paul just says, listen, in my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but, what, but that, that with all boldness 
And as always, so now Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it is by my life or by my death. So he says, I don't know how this is going to turn out. I may die. I may be killed. I may get my head cut off. It doesn't matter. All I know is this one thing is for sure. God's going to show up. And people are going to be talking about this, whatever happens next, for generations. And guess what? Here we are. 2,000 some years later, and we're talking about the same thing that Paul was telling the book of uh, the, the Philippian believers that. That's powerful. That means God shows up every time. Every time. And I'm going to be a little bit more personal here. Some of you guys are going through setbacks right now. Maybe it's you lost your job. Maybe it's physical. You've got some physical ailments in your life right now. Maybe it's, you know, you got a wayward kid. Still not coming back to the Lord. Um, Maybe you just found out you're not going to be able to have kids. The doctor told you that, you know, you've been trying to get pregnant and you just can't get pregnant. Um, whatever the setback is, church, whatever the setback is, I want to ask you this. Are you afraid? Are you afraid? If you're afraid, stop focusing on the problem. All right? Start focusing on one thing, which is Jesus Christ is going to do something great in this midst. All right? Are you angry? Stop focusing on those people. Get off Facebook. Stop listening to the things that other people are saying. Stop listening. Stop letting that carry you down. And for us, I say all this, all the things I'm teaching you right now is because this chapter has revolutionized my walk with Christ this one year. This one year, I learned this. This is the only thing I've been learning, it seems like. God has been teaching me setback after setback after setback that he was going to do something great. And you know what? He did. The five things, when I left this church... A year ago, I asked you to pray for five things. It was people. I wanted God to start developing the hearts of the people where I was going to go. Provision, that God would provide the way, that God would give us protection all along this whole journey. Remember these five things? It's just peace and power. God met all five things with this opportunity for us to go to Indianapolis. All five of them. 120 people want to plant a church. God prepared the people. While I was in Columbus asking you to pray, he abundantly prepared the people for us to plant a church with. God provided the funding. I have not been without a paycheck since I left here. God provided the, the, the peace for my wife and I, even when we think, but here's the thing, how hard was it? I mean, I kept looking at the pain. I kept looking at the problems. I kept looking at all these people that were haters, you know? But every time I did that, I just got angry. I got frustrated. But when I started focusing on my purpose, I had clarity. And I began to lean into the prayers. And this is so powerful. You have no idea how powerful God used your random text messages and the random letters that you wrote to my wife and I when we were in Chicago. And you say, just praying for you, Pastor Joe and Becca. We love you. You know what that was? It was this. I was, you were, I was leaning into you. And I needed that confidence. I needed that. And God used you to help me with that. I felt personally, and I felt the hand of the Lord on my back. It's going to be okay, Joe. I'm going to work here. It's going to be awesome. Just trust me. And next thing you know, I just just said, God, it's right. You're right. It's going to be okay. I'm going to focus on you. I have confidence that it's going to work out. And then just pressed on, stretching forward, looking only at the Lord. And he did. He provided it. He gave us exactly what we were praying for a year and a half ago. So I stand here saying everything I just showed you from this text is true because it's scripture, but it's also true because I've experienced it. Where are you at? Where are you? Are you angry? Are you fearful? Trust the Lord.